All right, so it's four o'clock and we'll better start on time. So um, to all the participants who are out there, even though we cannot see you, we know you're there and welcome very much and thank you um, to the, to, for coming to this afternoon session of Medieval Academic Virtual um, Annual Meeting. My name is Neslihan Shanojak and I'm an Associate Professor of History at Columbia University. And I have the honor of ch chairing this session titled Poetics, Proverbs and Aesthetics. So the way we will do this is um, each speaker will have 20 to 25 minutes and I will introduce each one of them just before they speak. And when they are speaking, if you have any questions that come to your mind, please send them to me via an email. The email is written at the chat session, um, if you take a look at the chat, but I'll just repeat it here too. It's ns2495 at columbia.edu. Once all three speakers finish, then we will have our question and answer session and where I will ask the questions to the panelists that come from you. We cannot unfortunately have a live question and answer session because of the possibility of what is called Zoom bombing, um, which happened in an earlier session that is people who are not medievalists actually making, coming to the conference only to make offensive comments. So um, please do send me your questions to the email and I will make sure that the panelists will get it. So, and once again, thank you for being here and thanks to all of the panelists for coming to this session. So we will start with um, Professor Stephen Jaeger. Um, he's a professor emeritus of German comparative literature and medieval studies at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He has published extensively on courtliness, medieval education, love, charisma and art. His most recent book is titled Enchantment on Charisma and the Sublime in the Arts of the West and he's currently at work on a book on the medieval concept of the sublime. His talk today is titled Roger Bacon's Poetics, Nostalgia as Progressive Reform. Stephen. Thank you, Nestle. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. Rhetoric and poetics play a big part in the thought of Roger Bacon. In this talk, I want to underscore that importance, characterize his ideas on the topic briefly, and place the topic in a larger context. Nostalgia as progressive reform is the formula that uh, I'll take from my title. That formula describes a particular scheme in intellectual history. The contemporary world, so says the critic of the present, is corrupted by forces that betray and thwart the true nature of humankind, forces that have robbed life of creativity, vitality, heroism, dignity. The critic looks back to an earlier age, a classical or a primal period when culture was pure and pristine, where life was authentic and thought and action were not alienated, but in harmony with the essential nature of humanity. Let's call this scheme historical nostalgia. To bring it to a phrase, an inglorious present has superseded and betrayed a glorious past. Built into that trope is the appeal to return, to rescue and restore past glory. The root meaning of the word nostalgia is the pain of return, the Greek roots, uh, the pain of return, the pain of homecoming. And to put it even more briefly, let's move forward into the lost past. That formula describes the attitude of Renaissance humanists to the culture of late medieval scholasticism and their longing for the culture of antiquity. It describes Rousseau's vision of the malign influence of enlightenment science and learning and his longing for the state of nature. It describes Herder's attitude toward the dominance of French Roman Catholic culture over the pure Germanic spirit and his longing for the restored soul of the people, the Volksseele. I could mention Karl Marx, Friedrich Nietzsche, and Walter Benjamin, all of whom framed criticisms of the culture or the economy in the trope of historical nostalgia. Roger Bacon is a fascinating thinker. Amanda Power's recent book on Bacon, along with the many merits of its scholarship, 
also brings out that quality, his personal interest, personal fascination. He was born between 1214 and 1220, and he died in 1292. He was a strident critic of the intellectual and religious world of the mid-13th century. Unlike most who think in this historical trope, let's move forward into the distant past, Bacon was given an opportunity to redesign the entire system he held responsible for the downfall of intellectual and religious culture in the West. He received a letter in 1266 from Pope Clement IV. The Pope requests that Bacon send him secretly and soon the suggestions for the remedy of the crises they had talked about earlier. That was talks are, is, is subjects are not enumerated, but uh, obviously calling for Bacon's ideas on the reform of the universities and the church. Not bad for a scholar whose research had stalled and who saw himself in opposition to the major academic and religious trends of his time. The Pope's request elevated Bacon to the role of papal advisor on Christian education at the highest level and potentially the architect of a new program of university studies, even more the designer of a new intellectual world. 40 years, by the way, I'm I want to lay a particular stress on 40 years, so every time I say it, I'm going to twirl my finger uh, significantly. 40 years of his study had seemed in, uh, destined to wither on the vine. Now they will come to fruition, empowered by the greatest authority in Christianity. In his reply, Bacon presses the Pope to realize reform as his calling, is the Pope's calling. 40 years earlier, he tells Clement, a prophecy foretold of a Pope who will straighten out the confused and corrupted intellectual world of Christianity. Clement should make himself into that great promised reformer, says Bacon. Bacon's responses rained down on the Pope. By 1267, he had completed and sent to Rome his major work, Opus Maius, and two follow-ups, the lesser and the third opus, the Opus Minus and Opus Tertium, Various other individual treatises followed, summarized, summarizing the larger works and focusing on individual aspects. In a printed form, they fill over a thousand pages. Not bad work in a single year. They form a proposal for university reform of comprehensive scope. They point a way out, out of the stale, stagnant culture of universities that had set in in the past 40 years. They were full of thunderous denunciations of the current situation. The confusion of truth and learning started 40 years before when the mendicant orders allowed floods of young men into theological studies for which they were not prepared and sent them out as preachers for which they had no worthwhile training. For the past 40 years, ignorance and greed have corrupted studies. The ways of ancient wise men have been abandoned. For the past 40 years, Ignorant youths have made themselves masters and doctors of theology. Now Christendom is lost in boundless error. Studies proliferate to the downfall, not the sustaining of wisdom. Ignorance and corruption run rampant. There are three particular objects of his ire, church music in all its forms, rhetoric, and preaching. On music, this passage will give the flavor of his criticism. Everything in church music, Bacon writes, that has been done in the past 30 years has been done, uh, sorry, is a, mockery, is a mockery of the divine office. It is contrary to the art and contrary to the truth of music. It is a mockery before God and the holy angels and all men who are wise in the art. On theology, students are sent to advanced studies early and unripe. They are inadequately prepared in the study of biblical and other languages and are dogged by lack of good texts of the Bible. The book of sentences of Peter Lombard has replaced the Bible in university studies, much to their detriment. On preaching, for the past 40 years, the art of preaching has been lost and distorted. The present generation has, has destroyed it. Ignorance of rhetoric and poetics are major flaws. Those who practice this art fabricate endless eccentricities, 
which lack all sublimity or depth of wisdom. They waste their time with empty and vain verbosity, lacking any rhetorical polish and all power of persuasion. May God himself banish this nonsense from this church. What's to be done? The dire circumstances call for a comprehensive revision of the course of university studies. The new disciplines that Bacon proposes have garnered most of the attention in studies of his thought, languages, math, geography, optics, astrology, experimental science. And yet Bacon assigned the supreme role to rhetoric and poetics. Those arts compromise the seventh and effectively the last book of the Opus Maius. For Bacon, they are not the elementary arts of the trivium, that's where they were positioned in the entire uh, Western tradition of uh, the classification of the liberal arts up till that time. Rhetoric and poetics for Bacon are the fulfillment of logic and of moral philosophy and effectively of all the disciplines. They occupy this super eminent position because they are the arts of persuasion and persuasion, flexus animae, mind bending, not teaching and pleasing, but winning minds, converting, forming character, inculcating virtue, strengthening faith are the highest goals of learning and preaching. And in fact, says Bacon, the final purpose of the church itself. All other disciplines are speculative. Rhetoric and poetics, however, in the service of moral philosophy are practical. They are the means of perfecting man in the good. That places a great weight on preaching. The sermon operating in musical poetic mode exerts all the fundamental power, I'm quoting Bacon now, um, exerts all the fundamental power of persuading in faith and morals. It vehemently excites the listener to pursue the ultimate good of humanity, namely virtue and happiness. Therefore, this discourse is more noble than others. Grandiose speech overrides opinion, conviction, and judgment in the audience. It forestalls and preempts reason by suddenly snatching the mind away. It makes arguments, quoting Bacon now, arguments of ultimate beauty, so that the mind will be swiftly transported to consent before it can anticipate the opposite. There you see a, a, a dark side of rhetoric, the ability to take over the mind uh, and uh, the major voices in uh, uh, rhetorical theory have stressed that rhetoric is highly usable for good purposes and evil. Uh, Bacon also sees them, uh, sees rhetoric as usable in the cause of evil because he says that um, in the end of time, uh, the Antichrist is going to have one of his most powerful weapons to, per to pervert the masses in the form of uh, rhetorical persuasion. As an instrument of persuasion, sermons and discourses require the highest level of style, the grand or the sublime traditional classification, three levels of style, the humble, the middle or temperate, and the grand. Now, a, a longish quote from uh, Bacon, flexus, winning of the mind, requires magnificent speech. To persuade an audience to act upon things that they resist or only passively approve, the preacher requires passionate speeches, which in a magnificent way transform emotion into action. And to this end, the grand style is most appropriate. This form of argument, what, is, what he calls the argumentum poeticum, the poetic argument, the poetic discourse, always uses the grand style because it always speaks of grand and magnificent subjects. And to this end, the grand sounding form of speech is required, grandisonus, an interesting adjective. It makes use of sublime speeches, impassioned speeches, prophetic speeches. You see, I'm having trouble translating the word sermones. Sermones can be just language. It can also be speeches. It can be sermons. It can be discourses or, or simply words. The, this discourse, the poetic 
discourse can move, that is, inspire, stir, persuade the listener incomparably more profoundly than a logical demonstration. Bacon goes on. It draws on language that is beautiful and decorous, fitting to the subject in the highest degree, so that the mind is snatched up swiftly and suddenly and moved to love of virtue and happiness and to hate of vice. And therefore, poetic speeches or discourses, sermon is poetic key, which are composed with beauty and with the ability to stir the mind ought to be ornamented with all the beauty of narrative speech and bound tightly, important point, to every law of meter and rhythm. As in Holy Scripture in the original language, Hebrew, and in Boethius on the Consolation of Philosophy, and Alanus on the Complaint of Nature, the Poetics of Horus, and the Hymns of the Church, and much of the Divine Office. So that by beauty and sweetness of speech, the mind will be immediately and strongly moved." End quote. Linking the Psalms, hymns, and the liturgy places him, of course, in the heart of traditional liturgical song. But giving priority to the Psalms and prophets in the original language is striking. Bacon puts forward a particularly broad vision, I'll come back to that, uh, puts forward a particularly broad vision of uh, the place of sublimity of style, sung, spoken, and performed within the religious life. In his positioning of Hebrew poetry at its origin, uh, Bacon anticipates the 18th century discussion of Hebrew poetry as the earliest and most authentic source of the sublime, that argument made very extensively by a number of important figures in the 18th century in the contest uh, with uh, Longinus, the great Greek uh, formulator of uh, the theory of the sublime. Uh, the Psalms and prophetic texts serve as primary models because, quote, all of scripture is laced with rhetorical ornaments in various places, all the more in those places where we do not find common diction. For in the prophets, where God's meaning is shrouded in marvelous enigmas, the highest divine truths out of all proportion with our minds are brought into conformity with us through prophetic language, sermon is. Propheticus. I hope that uh, gives, uh, uh, gets the attention of philosophers in the audience who uh, might be thinking in terms of uh, a very different conception of language and its ability to transmit divine truths. Uh, since Abelard's thought on language, it has human language is generally counted as man-made, fabricated, and, um, and rather uh, deceptive and uh, difficult to use or impossible to use by way of communicating the ultimate truths. For Bacon, sermon is propheticos. Prophetic sermons can uh, allow us to bring our understanding in some proportion with the highest truths. Bacon here is positing a sacred oratory, a sacra eloquentia, and I would like to suggest that uh, that such a thing exists. Uh, uh, it doesn't take much arguing to show it. Alongside the classical tradition of rhetoric, as we have generally understood it, and which has commanded all the attention, or most of the attention of, uh, of uh, philologists in medieval studies. In the next paragraph, he proclaims that this kind of eloquence, that is the kind that partially unveils sacred mysteries, has its own art of oratorical performance, which can express sacred truths more persuasively than language. Quoting, if poetic persuasion is to be fully effective, it requires not only effective speech that inspires by its sounds and by magnificent sentiments that sway the mind, but by emotion and the gestures fitted to it, uh, conforming to the verbal expression, so that the listener is deeply moved more by the emotions expressed bodily than by sentiments in speech. He says also, lots of tears belong in that particular performance mode. The link between music and the poetics of persuasion is vital. Without good music of the art, uh, I, I'm sorry, without good knowledge of the art of music, no one can compose sublime speech. To enchant with its sounds and enrapture with its language, uh, music must, must be made 
more, I'm quote, uh, quoting, more expressive, more sensual, more lucid. Uh, an interesting chain of words, expressius sensibilius distinctius. You see how I translated it, the real problem is sensibilius. Music must be made more sensible, more, 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 more appealing to the senses. Um, um, uh, it's a difficult uh, a string of words to understand as uh, descriptions of the effect of music. In the present age, music has lost all gravity and authority. It can have a force to move the mind and soul equal to or above speech. For above all arts, this is a quote now, for above all arts, music exercises a miraculous power. Poetic sermons then are poetry or musical poetry, not just poetic language. They have rhythm, they have meter. Uh, they, their uh, models are the Psalms, uh, Boethius and Alanus, their prosometrical tracts. These are the patterns for the highest form of sacred discourse in the reformed university. And by the way, those are the form in which the theory of uh, sacred eloquence for the middle ages is transmitted not by prescriptive uh, theoretical writings, less by prescriptive theoretical writings. There is Augustine non Christian doctrine. The aesthetic values that emerge from Bacon's writings are far from what the art of composition in the Middle Ages is generally taken to be. Um, here's, a, here's a comment by Umberto Eco that seems to me to formulate that conventional notion of what medieval art is. Eco writes in his book on uh, beauty in the Middle Ages, art was a knowledge of the rules for making things. Art was not expression, but construction. The Middle Ages theory of art was first and foremost a theory of craftsmanship. That is a pretty good description of Bacon's view of the corrupting ideas that replace true art in music, compositions, poetry, and preaching. It is the opposite of the poetics that he proposes. Concepts like beauty, passion, and sublimity of inspire, inspired prophetic writing, <clears throat> the ability to enrapture and transform, these are Bacon's basic aesthetic vocabulary. He often sounds like a Christianized Longinus, defining the sublime in the sacred elements, in the sacred eloquence of Christianity. So those few comments give us a sketch of what Bacon wants as the pinnacle of reformed university studies and why he wants it. But where does it come from? Uh, what was back there on the other side of that temporal line of demarcation 40 years before 1266, after which studies went to hell? To understand the historical circumstances that put the Franciscan order in turmoil around that time, you should read the study by our uh, session leader, Nestle Hensenochak, of the foundations of Franciscan learning, the poor and the perfect, a book that appeared in 2012. She documents the rise of an intellectualized mode of thought, learning and preaching, a sophisticated scholastic university education that made pastoral care far less attractive for the preaching orders than scholastic argumentation and well-structured sermons on highfalutin questions, what is known as the modern or the university sermon. This trend forced out a charismatic mode after the death of St. Francis in 1266, by no chance precisely 40 years before Bacon received the letter from Clement IV. That is the greater trend against which Bacon is reacting. As for the conception of passionate and enrapturing discourse, Bacon took his terminology from the practices of sacred eloquence as they had developed from patri patristic times to the end of the 12th century. Bacon would certainly have grown up with knowledge and understanding of the terms sermo propheticus, sermo affectuosus, impassioned speech, sublimitas sermonis, sublimity of speech, stilus grandis, the grand style. He no doubt had witnessed a rhetoric of passionate expression aimed at persuasion, an effect of raptus on the audience, and its stimulant in the grand style. 
<coughs> a sublime and prophetic language, grand style, eloquence that transports the reader or listener to higher realms were modes of expression actually practiced by an elite of theologians and preachers from Augustine to Alain of Lille from the fourth to the 12th century. He mentions, Bacon mentions Berthold of Regensburg, a German uh, preacher who preached in the vernacular as the only figure currently preaching in that mode. Bacon's poetics are a call for reform of the institutions of Christian learning according to the aesthetic values of a recently past age. <clears throat> There's an even more important line of influence on Bacon's aesthetic thought, the Hebrew language, the poetic forms of the poetry of the Old Testament. Bacon started but did not finish a Hebrew grammar. He called for the study of the biblical languages as the presupposition of restoring authentic texts of the scriptures, hopelessly corrupt in his own age, he claims. <coughs> Hebrew poetry speaks the poetic discourse in its pure and original state. Quote, since the Holy Spirit revealed the beauty and efficacy of divine wisdom, the theologian must approach the wisdom of God in the Hebrew language so that he knows he is drinking the waters of wisdom in their pure form from the fountain itself, ex ipso fonte, that could have come from a 15th century humanist. <coughs> this aspect of Bacon's thought and its relation to his ideas on rhetoric and poetics is underappreciated, but my I'd like to talk more about it when my time is up for this presentation. So Bacon's literary aesthetic is, sure, obligated to Aristotle and Augustine, but premised on his vision of a lost primal prophetic poetic truth, <coughs> a prisca eloquentia, premised also on the mission of restoring it that extends from the ancient past of Judaism through Christianity up to that catastrophic turn that occurred 40 years before. We recognize the trope of historic no historical nostalgia that trope ordinarily has revolutionary power, as in the instances I mentioned at the outset. Rousseau's ideas on the French Revolution, Herder's ideas on German Romanticism, and ultimately on Nazism. Unfortunately, Bacon's sweeping revolutionary reform proposals created no revolution. <coughs> Pope Clement IV died in 1268 before he could act upon or even react to Bacon's works piled high and gathering dust somewhere on his desk. The things Bacon deplored continued more or less untroubled by his opposing ideas. He would surely have taken some satisfaction in the humanism of the Renaissance, which in many ways shared his sentiments <coughs> and which realized some aspects of the program he had proposed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. This is wonderful. Thank you also for the publicity of my book. And it's a subject very dear to me, and I hope to have a very good discussion about this at the end of all our sessions. Um, so I'm now turning to the second speaker, um, Johanna Kramer. Um, Johanna Kramer is an associate professor of medieval literature in the English department at the University of Missouri. Her research interests span from early medieval English lit religious literature and popular religious practices to folklore and, and genre studies. Her most recent publication, a collaborative edition and translation of anonymous Old English prose saints' lives, is about to appear with the Dumbarton Oaks Medieval Library and is also available for pre-order. Her current book project is a study of proverbs in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales as a way of accessing and interpreting medieval secular and religious cultures. And her talk today is titled Proverbs and Intertextual Debating in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. None. Thank you so much, Leslie, for that introduction. Thank you to everybody out there who is here today listening to our session. Um, we're going to go from the very big ideas that Stephen just presented to some, some narrow things, but a connection I see already is that of the use of rhetorical tools for moral education. So um, I'm in my paper today most broadly thinking about genre and in particular about interactions between um, genres or the influence sort of, of one verbal form on another. And the genre I'm interested in are proverbs that is the recognizable and self-contained verbal utterances 
usually in a fixed form um, that convey some piece of traditional wisdom. So I'm going to um, share my screen now so that I can go to the slideshow. So bear with me for a second that you can all see that and follow along with that. Okay. Geoffrey Chaucer dexterously deploys hundreds of proverbs across his works, giving them a status that far exceeds their reputation as rhetorical flourish or moralizing gloss. Their ubiquity makes medieval proverbs richly informative sources for multiple analytical categories, oral and written, learned and popular, Latin and vernacular, religious and secular. Nevertheless, scholarship on the Canterbury Tales largely neglects them, with the exception of a few isolated studies of individual proverbs and Nancy Mason Bradbury, who has brought the discussion of proverbs as an embedded microgenre, as she calls it, into Middle English studies. <clears throat> Building on her work, I treat proverbs as a significant literary corpus in themselves, seeking to understand this microgenre in the rich uh, context of medieval literary culture. My paper today, which is part of a book-length study on, of the functions of proverbs in the Canterbury Tales, examines the interactions of the genre of proverbs with the tales in which they appear. Chaucer embeds proverbs into the Canterbury Tale as a whole to isolate thematic connections between them and by commenting on the main action and on controversial social, political, and ethical issues the repetition of proverbs of one proverb in two or more tales can establish entire intertextual debates. One such repeated proverb links the wife of Bath's prologue and the merchant's tale, the two tales that I will read closely in this paper today to demonstrate how one such intertextual debate unfolds. So in regard to these two tales, I argue that Chaucer uses the repeated proverb to inscribe the Canterbury Tales with an intertextual debate about marriage and at the same time to guide audiences towards understanding who has the correct view on marriage based on how skillfully and correctly speakers employ proverbial wisdom in each text. Before I discuss the wife of Christ, Wife of Bath's prologue and The Merchant's Tale, I will give some examples of multiple appearances of proverbs in Chaucer's tales. One way in which the microgenre can be classified is by how significant a given repeated proverb is to the plot, to prominent themes, or to one another. Some repeated proverbs are common and simply fit the context, but they do not directly speak to each other. So an example of this is uh, words must be cousins to the deed, the word is morte, they cause unto the day, day, which appears in the general prologue and also in the Mansible tale, Mansible's tale. So there's a similar context, but there's no obvious connection across these texts. Another example is covetous or avarice is the root, the mother, the ground of all evils, which appears twice in the tale of Melody and not surprisingly perhaps in the Parson's tale. And while each instance of the proverb makes the same point, of course, the parallel uses here cannot be said to be directly engaging with each other. But there are also proverbs that more clearly align with the prominent theme in the tale. And these instances assign a clear function of emphasis to proverbs. The proverb work by all counsel and you shall not rue is an example for this case. This proverb barely appears in the Miller's Tale, the Merchant's Tale, and the Tale of Malaby. These are all um, tales about a character seeking and accepting advice or rejecting it, as the case may be, and the fallout thereof. So one certainly does not need a proverb to make this shared theme visible or to prompt one to place these tale, tales in conversation to examine the theme of advice. However, I would say that these well-placed proverbs bring the intertextuality of this theme more sharply into focus. More significantly, they give us at least some indication perhaps that Chaucer did in fact have an interest in the theme of advice and deliberately connected the tales through the repetition of these proverbs. A clear favorite for Chaucer was Pete reneth zone in gentil herte, pity runs soon in a gentle heart. This proverb appears three times in the Canterbury Tales and once in the Legend of Good Women in this form, but then we have additional variants of that proverb. Um, they can be found in the Man of Law's Tale and in the Squire's Tale. 
So that makes for a total of five occurrences in the, Can in the Canterbury Tales alone. And then there are two more proverbial statements on the link between nobility of character and actions that can be added to this. Um, there's, there, so they're, they're not the proverb itself, but they express the same idea and use some of the same language. So there's one of those in the Wife of Bath's prologue and one in the Squire's Tale. And that would then expand the conversation to even more tales. The emphasis of this proverb falls on pity and gentilesse. Scholars have thoroughly explored the Canterbury Tales preoccupation with the question of what tr true gentilesse or nobility, gentility is, and this proverb fits well with this preoccupation. The instances of the proverb, moreover, punctuate each tale in a way that pulls this theme to the surface and makes it memorable enough that the audience will recognize it again and again as more instances accumulate across tales. One can thus follow a developing conversation that examines or even tests the idea of gentilesse as linked to pity and moral action in the varied context of five different tales. These instances demonstrate that proverbs can be key tools for establishing or confirming, but importantly, also for interpreting shared themes. So let me now turn to one specific example of a repeated proverb. This proverb links the Wife of Bass prologue and the Merchant's Tale in an intertextual debate about marriage, revealing decisively each character's respective views on marriage and their fundamentally different attitudes towards the value of proverbial wisdom. The modern English version of this proverb is, diverse schools make perfect clerks. In the Wife of Bath prologue, Alison herself uses the proverb, and in the Merchant's Tale, it is spoken by January, one of the tale's main characters. Arguing that one should not be restricted to having only one husband in life, the wife uses the proverb to advertise the advantage she has derived from having been married five times. She says, e blessed be God that ye have wedded Phoebe. So blessed be God that I've married five, of which I have picked out the best, both in regard to their lower purse and their chest. Diverse schools make perfect clerks, and diverse practice in many various works makes the workman truly perfect. A five husband schooling I am. So in contrast to the wife, Jenry, the so-called worthy knight of the merchant's tale, has been a happy bachelor for 60 years, who now wants to marry um, to produce a legitimate heir. He searches for a young and inexperienced wife. A widow or any older woman, anyone over 30, is out of the question. For sondre scholas marken sotile clerkes, as he says, for various schools make skillful clerks. A woman of many schools is half a clerk, but certainly men can guide a young thing just as men can mold uh, warm wax in their hands. Therefore, I tell you plainly in a sentence, I will have no old wife exactly for this reason. In other words, a woman with too much experience makes a woman too skilled, too ingenious, just like a well-schooled clerk. So in both instances, the speakers apply the proverb to themselves, to their own particular situations. And in one remarkable similarity between the two instances, they both use the proverb specifically to comment on the value or not of experience in marriage, even though the proverb itself is not explicitly about marriage. While the wife of Bath and Jenry apply the proverb in a shared context, they do so to opposite effects and in a way that allows the audience to decide who is right in this debate. So today I focus on these different effects and what they can tell us about the significance of the microgenre of proverbs to the larger tale cycle. The wife applies the proverb positively to her wealth of marital experience, while Jenry, as he faces wedlock, uses it to express his negative view of experience and marriage. These opposite senses, in part, are achieved by the verbal choices of each speaker. The two versions of the proverb are not identical, and I've put them up here so that you see the differences in bold. So um, the words diverse and sundry, diverse and sundry, they are they're about equivalent to each other. So I'm gonna focus here on parfit and sotile and the use and the difference between those two. So the wife of Bath's lexical choice of parfit has exclusively positive meanings, making her proverb thoroughly affirmative. Um, but the adjective sotile 
that Janeray uses has a much wider semantic range from positive, such as ingenious and refined, to negative, like cunning, insidiously sly, and deceitful. So when considering the full range of meanings that Sotil can carry, then we can readily see that Chaucer makes a clever word choice here. In light of Janeray's misogynistic attitude, all semantic denotations, positive and negative, reverberate with his version of the proverb, and the negative ones make his version a cautionary proverb rather than an affirmative one, like Allison's. Allowing for these additional meanings make, makes January's pro, um, version of the proverb more interesting and multivalent and also more insidious and manipulating because one has to probe below the proverb's expected surface meaning to discover all possible meanings, including the ones he may truly be intending. The effects of these verbal choices are indicative of how the wife and January each use the proverb more broadly. When Allison says that diverse schools make perfect, perfect clerks, she means this honestly and in a positive sense. It's a good thing when clerks go to many schools as they will presumably learn a wider range of skills. Many marriages equip a woman with more skills. The wife of Beth further emphasizes these positive effects of diverse marital schooling in the lines following the proverb, the, the proverb which also bring her back to her own training. So you can see those here. Um, diverse schools make perfect clerks and diverse practice in many various works makes the workman truly perfect. And for herself, she has five schools that she went to. So that's how many skills she learned, right? This means that the uh, wife deploys the proverb as a legitimizing tool to establish her authority in marriage, both as a speaker of the prologue and as narrator of her eventual tale. The proverb underlines that she has without a doubt accumulated the necessary experience to speke of woe that is in mariage, as she says in the opening lines to the prologue. Not only is the proverb's content suitable to the point she wishes to make, but she also draws on it because it is an authority in and of itself. As a source of traditional wisdom, it bestows authority on its user. For the rhetorically skilled wife, the proverb thus acts as an effective legitimizing tool on multiple levels. As already indicated by um, his contrasting word choice, January uses the um, proverb precisely to the opposite effect. So when he says various schools make skillful or crafty, cunning, deceitful, complicated, insidiously sly clerks, um, and that a woman of many schools is half a clerk, he expresses, again, truthfully from his perspective, that he does not like overly trained clerks and neither does he like a woman with too much training through previous marriage. So too much schooling never seems to be a good thing in his view. Through his negative application of the proverb, January then uses it as a delegitimizing tool for it works to exclude a large number of perfectly acceptable women from his marriage pool. We know from this and other passages that producing an heir is not his only motive for marriage. He states clearly that he desires to exert control over his wife and that he wants a sexually attractive mate. These desires reappear at the wedding feast when he repeatedly fantasizes about sexually assaulting May during their wedding night. Therefore, when applied to January's selection of a wife, the proverb actually serves to delegitimize all women, inclu including May, as maids that are in any way equal or should at least be honored to some extent. Overall then, the wife uses the proverb to assert the social value of women in a relentlessly patriarchal society. She lifts women up and argues that experience perfects a woman adding value to her as a maid. To January, the proverb, problematically so, gives permission to assert his predatory and mercantile power over women, maintaining that any experience spoils a wife and her social value. In the end, though, it is the wife of Bath who uses the proverb in its correct version, both in terms of its intended meaning and in terms of its standard formulation by using the word parfait, which is the, the standard default form or formulation of that proverb. Moreover, and satisfyingly so, 
the wife's correct position and Jenny's incorrect position on marriage are reinforced by additional proverbial cross-references between the two tales. As we already saw after the initial proverb that's here in the first line, um, the wife draws on another proverbial statement, this time practice makes perfect. And I've put the parts of that in bold here. She specifically refers here to a workman who gets perfect by practice. This passage very much invites comparison to January on his wedding night when he labors in vain in the marital bed. He in turn also uses a proverb to explain his protracted efforts. There needs no workman whatsoever the hebe that my both the work well and hastily. This will be done at leisure perfectly. There is no workman, whosoever he may be, who can work both well and hastily. That may, um, yeah, this will be done perfectly at leisure. So um, looking at these passages side by side, you can see that the words workman, work, and perfectly that Jenner uses produce a triple verbal echo to the wife of Bath's proverb, reinforcing the clear link between the tales. At the same time, this moment in the merchant's tale again exposes the two speakers' very different skills in wielding proverbial statements. They both think they use them to their advantage, but this backfires for January. In his case, the proverb is only a feeble excuse for his poor performance on his wedding night and makes him only look more foolish in the end. Lack of practice is not his only problem. Through this proverb, practice makes perfect, Chaucer makes a joke at January's expense by comparing him, who is a much less skilled workman than he thinks he is, to the wife of Bath, who has had plenty of practice and is good at it. The scene during May and January's wedding night also sets up further intertextual cross-referencing that goes beyond the wife of Bath's prologue and the merchant's tale. January uses a proverb that is later repeated by the parson. Expanding the debate as conducted through proverbs to a third tale not only adds complexity to the discussion about husbands and wives, but also proves further that January is wrong about marriage and the proper treatment of a wife. So when the old man labors unsuccessfully on his wedding night, he proclaims that a man can commit no sin with his wife, nor hurt himself with his own knife, for we have permission by law to play with each other. January completely violates any common sense here. Of course a man can harm himself with his knife. And of course a man can sin with his wife, certainly according to medieval theologians who see at least some sex in marriage very much as a sinful act. January inverts the proverb's meaning and perversely misinterprets it, since the actual proverb states, a man may sin with his wife and hurt himself with his wife. So the standard formulation or default version of the, of the proverb is uh, phrased in the positive, not, with the, not as the negative. So here we have yet another instance in which January turns proverbial wisdom on its head and in this case even goes against the view of the church. Now, if sheer um, logic does not already predict that January has it wrong, the Canterbury Tales picks up the thread of this debate once more in the Parson's Tale, where the proverb appears again, this time in its proper form. The Parson says, many a man thinks that he cannot sin through any lecherousness which he does with his wife. Certainly, that opinion is false. God knows a man can kill himself with his own, his, with his own knife. So perhaps throwing a barb specifically at the merchant by quoting this proverb, the parson enters the debate about the sacramental relationship between husband and wife and reveals even more sharply January's misapplication of the proverb, his misguided perspective on marriage, and also his profound rejection of the kind of communal common sense that is passed down through proverbial wisdom. Precisely because of his misuse of wisdom, the proverb guides audiences to recognize that January has an incorrect view on marriage in this debate. His idiosyncratic use of proverbs consistently demonstrates that he is incapable of wielding wisdom properly, and consequently, the view expressed through the proverb is incorrect too. You cannot at the same time cite the proverb incorrectly and get its content right. 
The repetition of proverbs in the Canterbury Tales points at the lively and meaningful interaction of genres with one another. A proverb is a patently small verbal unit and can therefore seem insignificant to an entire work, especially one as expansive as the Canterbury Tales. As I've shown though, it can have a powerful effect on the larger work in which it appears. A proverb is a verbal unit that can stand on its own as a complete utterance. At the same time, for a proverb's metaphorical content to become fully unlocked and gain concrete meaning, it depends on interaction with an immediate context that is interpreted in the light of the proverb and fills it with specific content and a specific meaning that occurs, um, that, that is created through the context in which it appears. The dual status is self-contained yet context dependent is reflected in the proverb status as microgenre. As a microgenre, proverbs shoulder a lot of work in the Canterbury Tales. They focus attention on shared themes and other links between tales. They encourage the audience to actively consider those themes and other ways in which tales talk to each other. They comment on the action, evaluate characters and their choices and values, and perhaps even give, give a glimpse into Chaucer's own position on these topics. The interactions among genres in the Canterbury Tales leads to rich and sometimes unexpected insights about characters, as well as about the social concerns of medieval audiences. Given all this, Chaucer's nuanced multi-uses of proverbs demonstrate the importance of this microgenre to his work overall, and the thoughtfulness, dexterity, and sophistication with which he deploys them. The examples I discuss today support the argument I make in my larger project that in the Canterbury Tales, proverbs function as provocative rhetorical and polemical tools that guide readers through arguments about controversial subjects such as women's authority in marriage or the moral ordering of knowledge. Therefore, by helping us recognize and evaluate social, political, and religious debates of Chaucer's time, proverbs as a particular form of literary and popular practice open a window onto late medieval English society and culture at large. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rana. This was fascinating. Um, I want to now move on to the third speaker, but before I do so, I just would like to remind again, once again to the participants that you don't have to wait until the end of the sessions and until the question and answer session. If you send me now, um, the questions that you have on Professor Kramer's and Professor Jäger's talks, I will put them together and they will be ready for the question and answer session. So please do so. Our third speaker is today is Eileen Morgan. Miss um, Morgan got her BA degree from Bryn Mawr and she is now a first year doctoral student of the Medieval Institute at the University of Notre Dame. She studies medieval food by way of history of science, medicine, and technology, and considers recipe traditions as sites of intersection between medieval theories of natural philosophy and material practices. She is a recent recipient of the Duffy Fellowship at Notre Dame, and also a winner of the Medieval Academy of America annual meeting bursary. Her talk today is titled Homsil et Suave, Peacock's Natural Philosophy and the Edible Art of Altering Nature. Thank you. The medieval term entremet refers to a form of banquet entertainment particular to the medieval period. Entremet were technical masterpieces that combined artistry with mechanical and culinary expertise and a strong sense of whimsy. The etymology of the word in French, deriving from entre, meaning between, and may, meaning courses or dishes, indicates the most salient aspect of the category. Entremet appeared between courses. Entremet could be comprised of live animals, human performers, puppets, sculptures, automata, painted set pieces, fire displays, mechanical devices, and certain edible dishes. And yet historians of art, of performance, of culture and politics, and of food have had trouble rendering this remarkable diversity in their own scholarship. As a rule, historians interested in politics, performance, and art do not consider entremet in their culinary context, and historians of food seldom mention non-culinary entremet. 
By examining di several different recipe books, instructions for how to prepare and present a roasted peacock in its own plumage, as if it were alive, I will show some of the ways in which the significance of entremet derived from the very liminality of the category. Both materially and thematically agnostic, medieval entremet were also all, to a greater or lesser extent, the product of artifice. By appearing to violate boundaries between the natural and unnatural, living and dead, mundane and exotic, possible and impossible, entremet provoked a variety of affective responses in feast attendees. In the case of the peacock, which I take as representative of medieval entremet, these affective responses actually depended on the banquet attendees' knowledge of the natural world and recognition that the entremet subverted the natural order. Combining cookery, natural philosophy, and technical skill in order to create illusory effects, the entremet of the peacock demonstrates the conceptual compatibility of the such categories in the minds of late medieval people. For today, I've chosen to examine four recipes detailing how to prepare a peacock entremet. There's a lot more to say and many more recipes I could talk about, but in the interest of time, I will be sticking to the recipes themselves. This is still a work in progress, in other words. The first recipe, uh, the first cookery book, known as the Beyondier, is a collection of recipes dating from the 13th century or earlier, commonly associated with Guillaume Tirel, also known as Taivon, master cook to Charles the V of France, the Viandier contains the first detailed description of an entremet. The second recipe comes from the collection known as Du Fait de Cuisine, written by Maester Chicard in 1420 for his patron and employer Amadeus VIII, then Duke of Savoy. The third recipe appears in an anonymous 15th century manuscript known as the Neapolitan Recipe Collection. Finally, the fourth recipe is a Latin recipe from the 15th century collection of Italian humanist Bartomeo Sacchi, also known as Platina entitled De Onesto Voluptate et Valetudine. This work is commonly considered the first printed collection of culinary recipes. So let's take a look at our first recipe for how to prepare a peacock. The original texts are in the PowerPoint. I will read English translations aloud. Originally, I planned on having a handout, so just bear with me here. From the Viandier, the first recipe for how to prepare a peacock as an entremet. Peacocks. The proper thing to do is to blow and inflate the peacocks like swans and to roast them and glaze them in the same way. And they should be presented as the last course, which is to say as the final entremet. And when they are redressed, it is best to have a slender or delicate wooden skewer to pass through the feathers of the tail or a little bit of brass thread to draw up the feathers as if the peacock were spreading its tail. The peacock recipe follows immediately after a recipe for a swan prepared in the same way as part of a larger section devoted to entremet. As is typical for a medieval recipe, there are no ingredients listed aside from the main ingredient, the peacock itself. Neither are there instructions on how to roast or glaze the peacock, what sauces it ought to be consumed with, or any other details of preparation. The preceding recipe for a swan offers no more detail in this regard, though it specifies that one should use a straw to inflate the space between skin and flesh. The use of a straw in this manner is a technique that does not apparently require much more explanatory detail for the presumed to be experienced reader of the recipe collection. Neither are there instructions on how to go about redressing the peacock in its skin in this recipe. Rather, it's a fait accompli. All that remains for the medieval cook would have been to ensure that the tail was exhibited in its full glory. Implicitly, the lifelike display of the tail feathers was the goal of the entremet. The recipe includes two alternative techniques to elevate the head and tail of the peacock so that it appears lifelike, using skewers to spread the peacock's vibrant and iridescent tail feathers so that it appeared as though the peacock were doing so of its own volition. The method for this display is subtle. The instructions specify that the skewers employed for keeping the tail feathers aloft ought to be thin twice, heavily implying that the dowels were not to be seen. Likewise, the alternative use of a bit of brass thread would have had an inconspicuous effect compared with the drama of the display. A stark contrast between the instructions, the intended effect emerges, and the intended effect emerges. Uh, the instructions explain very plainly the means by which the peacock is made to appear lifelike, but the supports themselves, whether dowels or brass thread, are intended to be as subtle and inconspicuous as possible in order to make the peacock appear as though it were truly alive. The clear instructions of the recipe are at odds with the intended effect. The cook's technique is meant to be undetectable in order for the entremet to be successful in creating the illusion of life. 
In the 1420 recipe collection du fait de cuisine, the cook, compositor, Meister Schickart includes the recipe for the redressed peacock as one of five medium scale entremet as part of a much larger entremet. This entremet élevé, or raised entremet, is a castle made from pastry, which is then mounted on a four man litter. At each of the four towers of the pastry castle is a smaller entremet, such as a suckling pig or a similarly redressed swan breathing fire. From trees in the center of the courtyard of the pastry castle, branches extend over the castle walls, each, quote, bearing fruits and flowers of every sort of tree, and upon those branches will be birds of every variety, end quote. The use of live birds in entremet is well documented. A number of recipe collections call for live birds to be enclosed in cages made of pastry, or even in pies. As with the tree branches, it is unclear what these birds are made from. They might be real, sculpted, taxidermy, or even automata moved by hidden actors, as the castle also concealed several musicians. As much as the modern historian might long for a hint of more detail, this ambiguity might also be taken as an invitation suggestive of options. One could use either real or artificial birds in these entremets to a greater or lesser effect. At the center of this tower, beneath the birds and flowers and fruit, is the Fountain of Love, which was a real functional fountain issuing rose water and at least two kinds of wine. It's at this point that the instructions for preparing the peacock appear. Chicart writes that, quote, alongside the fountain should be a peacock which has been skinned and redressed. And for that I, Chicart, already named, am willing to instruct the master cook doing it in the artifice of that peacock. And this is done in order to do courtesy and honor to his lord and master. Therefore, he should take a big fat goose and mount it properly on a spit and roast it well, neatly and heartily, and then redress it in the raiment of the peacock and place it in the spot where the peacock should be set, beside the fountain of love, with its wings stretched out, and make it spread its tail open and hold its neck up high as if it were alive, by fixing a wooden stick in the neck and supporting it. For that reason, the cook should not singe the peacock, but should remove the pinions in order to dress the goose with them, and remove the skin and rump of the peacock altogether with their feathers. When he sets out the goose, he should use good skewers to make the goose spread its tail in exactly the same way the peacock would do if it were alive. And the peacock carcass that is mentioned above that, following the instruction of Ney Chicard, has been cunningly turned out. Take it and clean it carefully and dry it well and thoroughly and put it on a spit and roast it. When it is almost done, stick it with good whole cloves in the proper way. If the roasting is spoiled, set it back up on the spit all over again. Then let your lord know about your fraud with the peacock and let him order whatever it is his pleasure to do about it." End quote. Chicard, familiar with the taste of peacock, recommends substituting the coarse, dry, and generally unpleasant flesh of the peacock with the more succulent roast goose. The retention of the plumage allows for the peacock, as a symbol of courtly honor and glory, to fulfill its visual function as a signifier of the duke's magnificence, whereas the goose makes the entremet significantly more edible. Chicard's terms arms, in reference to the plumage of the peacock, here carries the sense of a vestment, emphasizing that the goose is being dressed for the feast, not unlike a courtier. The trick of substitution, however, does not pass by unremarked during the presentation of the dish before the cook's master. If the initial objective of redressing the bird was to make the peacock seem exactly as if it were alive, then the secondary objective, as shown by Chicard's final injunction, was to reveal another illusion beneath the first, that the peacock was in fact a goose. The instructions and the recipe imply that without this dramatic reveal, the substitution of one bird for another would pass by unnoticed. Layering subtlety upon subtlety, the entremet élevé creates first the momentary illusion of the living peacock amongst other possibly living birds. Then, as the effect fades and the peacock is discovered to be roasted and redressed, the cook introduces the revelation that under the skin and feathers is another bird entirely. Unlike the artifice of dowels to elevate the tail, the substitution of gooks for peacock is not a tacit substitution. Rather, by calling attention to the exchange, the cook forces the court to recognize and admire the cook's innovation. This aspect of the entremet functions as a signal of his cleverness and mastery of his craft. Chicard routinely draws attention to himself and his own mastery in this recipe. In the space of this very short recipe alone, he uses first person pronouns and identifies himself by name twice in connection with his own mastery of artifice, courtesy, honor, cunning, and expertise. 
The title maester also designates Shikart as an individual who would have undergone years of intensive training by apprenticeship before achieving mastery. Maester specifically denoted a form of guild or corporate membership, certifying an extremely high level of competence. Shikart's instructions to, quote, let your lord know about your fraud with the peacock and let him order whatever it is his pleasure to do about it, might easily have been intended to bring attention to the artisan as much as the deception. The entremet had a master cook behind it, whose name and legacy depended on this association between man-made marvel and technical expertise. The term l'art, which Shikart uses in this passage, has more in common with craft technique or artifice than the modern notion of high art. But make no mistake, this kind of culinary feat was art, requiring artistry and aesthetic sensibilities in addition to technical skill. The connection and tension between art, technical expertise, and the manipulation of nature is a common theme in these recipe collections, and in these recipes for peacocks in particular. Successful exploitation of this tension was one of the principal ways in which a professional cook might demonstrate his skill and mastery of his craft transforming the raw material of the peacock into a work of edible art. Perhaps the most detailed description for how to redress a peacock comes from the mid 15th century recipe collection from Naples, known as the Neapolitan recipe collection. The ostentatious ditches such as the redressed peacocks are collected under the rubric Mirabila Gule for amazing food. The recipe for redressed peacocks which seem living and how to make them breathe fire through their mouth is as follows. You should first kill the peacock with a feather, driving it upon its head, or else drain its blood from under its throat, as with a pig. But it's better to take out its tongue and then slice it under its body, that is, from the top of its breast to its tail, slicing only the skin and removing it gently so that it is not damaged. When you have skinned it, pull the skin right back up to the head, then cut away the head, which will remain attached to the skin. Do the same with the legs, and likewise the tail, taking out the leg bones so that the iron which will make the peacock stand will not be seen. Then take the greased, the, the skinned carcass and set it to roast, stuck with lardoons, or else baste it with grease often enough that it will not burn. And stick it with whole cloves, and fill it with the piglet stuffing, which is an earlier recipe, but without the garlic. Cook it gently so that its neck does not burn. If the neck should get too much heat, cover it with a damp cloth. When it is cooked, take it down and redress it in its skin, whose inside you have coated with spices, salt, and cinnamon. Then, when you have put its skin back on, get an apparatus of iron driven into a large cutting board and shove this iron through its feet and legs so it cannot be seen. In this way, the peacock will be standing so that it will seem to be alive. And to make it breathe fire through its mouth, Get a little camphor with a little fine cotton wool around it and put this into the peacock's beak and soak it with a little aqua vita or else with a fumy old wine that's volatile. When you want to serve it, set fire to the cotton wood and in this way it will breathe fire for a long time. To make it more magnificent, you can cover the peacock with gold leaf and then cover it with its skin. This set of instructions is much more practical than the previous two recipes, but also includes more detail for creating a more dramatically unnatural effect. Nowhere in nature will you find a peacock that breathes fire. In this recipe, it's even more obvious that the function of this entremet is not to seem exactly as though it were still living, but to make it appear as something more than alive, more than natural. Nor is there any of the substitution or drama of an unveiling of a deceit around the pre presentation of the peacock that Chicard recommends. Instead, the author presents ways in which the cook can make the dish appear more marvelous and na less naturalistic through the addition of gold leaf to be revealed when the peacock is carved and the fire issuing from its beak. The Neapolitan recipe collection survives in a single manuscript dating to the middle of the 15th century. The recipes and language point to the origin of the recipe collection. It could only have been produced in a region in Italy under the crown of Aragon with strong Catalan influences, essentially Naples. It is less formal a composition than either the Viandier or Dufay de Cuisine, and its recipes are less clearly organized. There is, for instance, no single section devoted to entremet or intermezzi in medieval Neapolitan, with the recipes instead organized by function or type. The author of this manuscript is anonymous, but he was clearly familiar with the expectations of a professional cook preparing a feast, urging the reader to be exact, fastidious, industrious, and precise. He writes at the end of the 186th recipe, quote, let the cook be a gourmand, not for his own sake, but for that of his master, end quote. 
The role of the professional cook was not just to cook, the cook was to uphold and enhance the social status and reputation of his master through the preparation of exquisitely designed feasts. Finally, from Bartomeus, Bartolomeo Sacchi's De Honesta Voluptade et Valitudine, On Right Pleasure and Good Health, the recipe for Ut Pavo Coctus Vigus Videri Posit, or Peacock Cooked So That It Seems to Be Alive, reads as follows. A peacock is killed either by dashing its feathers into its brain from above or by slitting its throat, as kids are accustomed to be killed, so that the blood runs out. Kids as in goats. Uh, the, then its skin is li slit lightly from throat to tail, and when it is slit, it is drawn with its fe feathers from the whole body up to the head, which is cut away and reserved with skin and legs. On a spit, roast the peacock itself, stuffed with spices and fragrant herbs. However, first, cloves are stuck into its breast, its neck wrapped in fine white linen, and it is continually moistened with water so that it will not wholly dry out. When the peacock is cooked and removed from the spit, cover it with its own skin so that it seems to stand on its feet. You put little iron rods fixed to a board made for the purpose through the legs and through the body to the head and tail so they are not seen. Some, for sport and laughter, put camphor in its mouth with cotton or wool and touch fire to it when it is brought to the table. It is even possible to gild roast peacock, which has been sprinkled with spices, with gold leaf for pleasure and magnificence. The same can be done with pheasants, crane, geese, capons, and other birds. This food is indeed digested slowly, is of little nourishment, and increases black bile and harms those with liver and spleen problems. The language and content are very similar to that of the Neapolitan recipe. The stated objective for this collection was to convey comprehensive information regarding food and health. Ranging from diet to philosophy to aesthetics to the proper amount of sleep, the overall structure and content of De Honesta Voluptade et Valitudine has much more in common with a medieval regimen of health than with a culinary recipe collection. There is little of the language of illusion in this set of instructions, but more space devoted to how to create the illusion. The illusion itself, however, is relatively straightforward, appearing in a collection with a slightly different purpose than those considered so far, focused more on health, the peacock is nestled in language strongly reminiscent of contemporary works of natural philosophy. This recipe collection also includes the first explicit mention of why someone would think to do something so strange as make a cooked bird seem alive. The explanation given is that the entremet is ad ludum et risum and ad voluptatum et magnificentatium, ma magnificentium, excuse me, for sport and pleasure, sport and laughter, pleasure and magnificence. Mas Michelle Carnes, writing on the sensory faculty of imagination and its role in the perception creation of marvels in the medieval period, has argued that, quote, imagination can give invented images the status of perceptions and generate the same affective, intellectual, and physical effects as perceived objects, end quote. In the case of entremet, as actual perceived objects that force imagination to come into play, the wonder and delight come from the unraveling process of discernment and the realization that the initial imaginative interpretation of the peacock as alive was false. By design, entremet invoke tensions between initial perception and secondary deductive application of rational thought and logic. So here you can see a recreated Baroque banquet table that is part of the Feast and Fast Art of Food in Medieval Europe, or sorry, in Europe exhibition at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. Um, food historian Ivan Day worked with Melissa Calaresu and Victoria Avery to create this tableau, which although it postdates my recipes um, and presents the various birds as parts of pies, nevertheless gives a spectacular real life example of some of the techniques I've described so far and their effects. Um, here you can see the swan, peacock, pheasant, and quite a few extraordinary resin sculptures of seafood and fruit, um, which are by David Astley. Having a nuanced understanding of the relationship between art, nature, science, and technique was itself a crucial aspect of courtly culture. If, as I have attempted to demonstrate, the point of entremet was their playful engagement with the boundaries between natural and unnatural, living and dead, edible and inedible, possible and impossible, mundane and extraordinary, then pre-modern people not only perceived a difference between each of these binary pairs, their understanding was su sufficiently nuanced to make visual gags that played on such distinctions. 
When one considers taste at the medieval or early modern banquet, one must consider both gustatory pleasure and intellectual discernment as equally indispensable and complementary forms of taste. The stated and unstated goals of the recipes I have examined in this very short talk show a stark contrast between the practicality of the instructions and the intended effect. The tension between art and nature is evident in the recipe's concern over the visibility of the cook's technique. The peacock is meant to look beyond lifelike, more than natural, awing spectators with the flawless technical execution of the artifice. Although often edible, entremets were less gustatory pleasures than feasts for the eyes. They were also a challenge not to trust one's senses completely, to try and figure out how the effect was accomplished. With the cook functioning as mediator and skilled manipulator of nature, entremet engaged the senses in order to engage the intellect. An aesthetic and intellectual exercise in wonder and sublimity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eileen. This was another fascinating paper. Okay, that means that we are done with the sessions. We have now 15 minutes for question and answer session. Um, I have received three questions for Stephen, one question for Eileen. So, I'll start with the first question. I'm going to give the questions in the order in which I have received them. For all other participants, my email once again is ns2495 at columbia.edu. If you press the chat button, there you can see it written. So you can still send me um, questions, but I'll start with the first question to Stephen. And this question comes from Teresa Gross Diaz at the Loyola University of Chicago. So she says, fascinating paper, thank you. Does Bacon in any way acknowledge what seems to have been widely appreciated at the time, namely the popularity of preachers using either common and humorous techniques or harsh fire and brimstone sermons? Does he directly argue that such sermons may be popular but are, but are not in fact efficacious? Or is his objection more the grousings of an ivory tower academic of fastidious tastes, tastes. In other words, do you think his critique truly founded on a desire for more efficacious preaching? Uh, let's see, she mentioned two, two kinds of uh, sermons. One was fire and brimstone, but what was the one just before that? Um, preachers using either common and humorous techniques uh, what, 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 or, or much, sorry, common. Common, common techniques. Mm -hmm. Not sure what that means. But anyway, fire and brimstone. Good question. Uh, yes, I mean uh, the the uh, uh, call for impassioned rhetoric. Um, you find you find that a lot. Uh, Actually, uh, Bertolt of Regensburg uh, is a good place to look, but also um, I talked about a, a Pentecost sermon by Isle Red of Riveau in an in a article that just appeared where uh, it's, a, it's an amazing sermon that pulls out all the stops and goes from, uh, uh, well, the creation of the world to uh, to uh, to a, a kind of uh, utopian uh, utopian condition of the church at the end of time, and um, you know is full of uh, at at one point thundering threats, uh, which you know uh, yeah fire fire and brimstone the uh, citing the uh, judgment scene in in Matthew chapter twenty five. So fire and brimstone for sure. I'm not sure what's meant by common elements. Uh, 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 if you mean uh, sort of typical conventional topoi, certainly full of them. Um, now, and I should say also in, in pursuing the question of sublimity of style in, uh, in sermons, um, it's all over the place in, 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 many, in many kinds of uh, uh, writings, uh, poetry, uh, tracts, but uh, in sermons, you have to read a lot of sermons 
before you find an exceptional one. It's rather like an, it's rather like uh, the novel in in the modern world. For every thousand novels that are written and published, there's perhaps one or two in a generation that you would consider really great. And that's what I'm looking for. Just those those one or two those, those exceptional things. Um, she she just sent me an email saying by common she meant non elevated. Non elevated. Oh sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Thank you, Stephen. I'll get back there, to the questions. There are many different tones and many different moods of uh, of sermons, uh, and uh, you know, a, a gifted preacher, um, a gifted preacher knows how to vary. And also someone, a gifted preacher like Bernard of Clairvaux, has what I would call a consistent tone, not, not a varied tone like I read, but um, uh, uh, a uh, more lyrical, uh, uh, more lyrical mode, um, uh, more what uh, he would have described as the voice of the dove as opposed to the voice of thunder, those are two. Uh, there's two different uh, modes of sermon writing. I hope I answered. I'm, I'm sort of felt my way around that question, uh, but it took, took a long course. Thank you. I'm also going to ask the panelists if they have any questions for each other. I'm happy to ask them too, but um, I wanted to ask to Johanna, um, this is very fascinating to me, your work on Proverbs. and. I'm really sorry for my ignorance, but um, how, how does one, that is, I'm reading so many sermons and theological material. I haven't read that much of the literary side of things, but how does one go about understanding, even noticing that a, a particular sentence used by an author is a proverb? Is there any <laughs> hint of knowing that at all? Um. Well, of course, the audience would, audiences would have recognized them, presumably, yes. because they're usually, so one of the sort of defining features of Proverbs is that they're current and that people yes. recognize them when they're used. So that's a little bit trickier um, from our end, right, from, the mo yes. from a modern yes. analysis. Yeah. But, um, you know, Proverbs, from, from the side of Proverbs study, Proverbs are classified by key words that they include. So, um, and you may, you may have noticed that actually I had, after, after I gave Proverbs I, in the titles on my slides, I usually had like a letter and a number with it. That was for people who are in Proverbs studies who know how to look them up. So they're, um, that's a particular resource um, by Whiting and Whiting that classify, so the, the letter, in the beginning refers to the key, the initial letter of a key word that's in it, it like a C in for covetous or, mm -hmm. and so on. So um, when you read a sermon and you suspect there might be a proverb, you would, you would um, take a key noun or key word that's in there and then you can look in the collections that are classified by these words. So that would be a way of you know, find, finding out. Because also there's, there's sort of different levels of proverbial statements. Some of them have to appear in the, in the form, they're always sort of quoted or cited in the same form and then they're more recognizable. But as you will know yourself from surely your own use of proverbs, mm -hmm. you can also of course adjust proverbs um, mm -hmm. to your own sentences and sort of, you know, mold them to fit, fit them into your own grammar. And then they're more difficult to recognize sometimes, but they will still depend on a key word that appears somewhere, right? It's not, exactly. it, yeah. you, you can't change it to the point where you don't recognize it anymore. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I'll be more attentive from now on. I know, they're great. <laughs> When you read the editions of the sermons, for example, you always have the biblical quotations or quotations, but you, no one tells you this is actually a proverb. I mean, the editors, I don't think they pay that much attention to it, but it's very useful actually. Yeah, and you, you can sort of think, if they're from certain books of the Bible, you can be pretty certain that they turn into proverbial expressions, right? Depending, like Ecclesiastes, and of course, proverb, the book of Proverbs, of course, and so on. So there's a lot of tracking of biblical material yeah <laughs> thank you so much thank you um i have a question sent by a member of the audience to eileen um 
So this is from Shelley Williams from Brigham Young University. And she asks whether you have ever tried to cook a recipe of peacock. No. No. <laughs> yeah. It's not easy to find a, a peacock. Well, they, they are wild in LA, but no, I've never so, uh, tried to cook a peacock. Would that be even legal to go out and hunt your <laughs> own peacock? Outside? I doubt it would be a good idea. Um, the one that was part of the Baroque banquet was actually raised in order to be like killed and eaten. Um, but the curators wanted to make sure that everyone knew that none of those birds were killed specifically for use in that tableau. Um, the swan died five years ago by flying into some electrical fence set up and had been in a fridge until they pulled it out. So, <laughs> but people do eat peacock. It's apparently not very good. So I'm not speaking to ask a question to Eileen. Um, no, I wanted to, I wanted to uh, comment on Eileen's paper, which I found fascinating, just because it, it gets you so into the theme of artifice, courtly yeah. artifice, uh, that that the bird has to be. You know, it's not it's not just about food. Anybody can eat. Anybody food. can eat. Yeah. It it's it's about and and you know, this, this aristocratic urge to get away from nature, to get above nature. Peasants are natural. Uh, the lower classes are, are, are pure nature, but, but, uh, but uh, uh, aristocracy reaches to, in the, in the way they dress, in the way they represent themselves, in the way they speak, to be far, far beyond, you know, to, to establish their superiority, their aristocracy. Uh, and also, I wanted to mention a, a hunt ceremony in the classical uh, German Tristan romance, uh, where the uh, hunt uh, uh, team captures a hind, and then um, is is about to cut it uh, cut it up. But the head huntsman Tristan, who's a young stranger in this land, says, "My God, that's not the way you should treat a." Uh, uh, a, a, a hind, uh, you have to cut it up in the courtly way. Mm -hmm. So what they do is he, he, he gives them instructions how to do it exactly. And they have to reconstruct, you know, after having taken off the legs and the head and so on, they reconstruct the uh, uh, animal as it, as, 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 it, as it was in nature, the legs in the right place and so forth, and carry it in that form in a formal procession to uh, to the court. Seems to me out of the same spirit of, uh, of what you're uh, talking about. It's uh, supposed to appear as it might have been. Yeah, the illusion of life is something that I want to get into a little bit more. Um, I have three questions for Stephen. One question for Johanna that has come in from the audience. So I'll I'll go with the question to Stephen. This is from Beth Williamson from the University of Bristol. Hi, Beth. Sorry? Okay. <laughs> Hello, Beth. She's an old friend. <laughs> okay, so she says the persistent references to 40 years of decline were fascinating. Is it significant that Bacon spoke of a period of 30 years in the case of developments that had made music a mockery? No, I. I ask that question myself, why uh, the insistence on 40 years and sort of nailing it down with the, uh, you know, pinning it clearly to the death of, uh, uh, death of St. Francis. Uh, I don't know what happened 30 years before, uh, what would that make it, 1236, and it would have to be, you would have to ask a historian of music about that. But my sense is that uh, he wouldn't, really insist on the exactness of these numbers, except uh, that in a very general way, the death of St. Francis. Nestle, I'm sure you uh, know what, the, the whole range of things that happened as a result of the death of Francis and how changes uh, occurred. But I honestly, uh, there's a lot of questions I have about uh, about the, the way Bacon represents music, and I can't really answer Beth's question very well. I, I actually have a, have a guess on this, Stephen. Um, 
it might be, it is not exactly 30 years, less than that, a little less than that. But in 1240, Haymo Faversham has become general minister and Haymo is accredited with doing a big liturgical reform. N not only in the Franciscan order, but it has become actually a new version of the divine office. Um, Haymo has abbreviated the divine office um, and changed, changed the way it was sung in the in the order and it has that, that has been taken on so we have to we might have to look carefully exactly what is it Haymo Faversham has done to divine office that was I think that's what Roger Bacon is referring because he doesn't like those English friars he doesn't like Alexander of Wales and Haymo Faversham and Haymo was responsible for a lot of the learning too yeah I, I should think that um, it would be fairly recognizable uh, the, the, you know, the, the before and the after should be easy to distinguish uh, from one another if you know uh, music. Uh, uh, you know, Margot Fassler's work on sequences shows there was a very big, you know, the, the advent of the sequence brought a, a, a very, very large change in the way sacred music was composed. Uh, you had individual poets. Uh, uh, you you uh, were, uh, you know, the 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 uh, corpus of uh, hymns grew uh, tremendously. Uh, the range of forms, also. So there there were big changes uh, going on. Uh, but uh, I mean, the the way Bacon describes the current contemporary music empty, without gravity, without uh, historical authority, suggests he wants, you know, the good old Ambrosian uh, uh, style hymn and the, and the traditional liturgy as opposed to some innovative uh, new forms. Next question is for Johanna. Um, it, it is from Jenna Phillips, who is a postdoctoral fellow at Huntington Library, and she says, thank you for three fascinating talks. Could Johanna Kramer expand in her comments about Chaucer's literary predecessors and their use of proverbs? Does Boccaccio employ proverbs in old French literature and music, including old French debate genres, such as the jeu parti? Proverbs are employed commonly. Do we have any information on whether Chaucer was inspired by these or was he simply drawing on a popular and oral tradition of proverb use? Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. I haven't actually thought about it all that much about it. I mean, there is obviously a long tradition and, and proverbs appear in all kinds of literary forms. Um, um, so, so it's, so for one, I think it's then hard to, to determine, is he inspired by those sources in the sense of, well, everybody's doing it. Um, you know, there it's just a very common um, kind of rhetorical tool to use, as you also mentioned in sermons, for example, and so on. And that's what I was thinking of when I heard Stephen's talk also, where proverbs are in, in the astictomini in the oratorical teachings are isolated as one of the sort of tools you're supposed to be using. Um, so They're also a really common theme in entreme is to physically represent proverbs is very common. Oh. Uh, that, yeah, so you have like pan, right? But you have panels, or you know, you know the famous like the paintings with the Dutch proverbs, the Netherlands. Not proverbs. even that. Like they would make things like sculptures, or right, but, but where you have visual representations yeah. of proverbs, like that, that kind, mm -hmm. that kind of a thing. So, but what I would have to look into more care carefully to answer Jenna's question is, you know, actually compare Chaucer very specifically to sources and see if. Um, similar proverbs show up in the same places, you know, where he has them to um, uh, as a as a way of accompanying the tales. And I'm afraid that I don't I, that I don't know that um, at this point. But that's a good path to pursue. I hadn't quite thought about it in those in those terms. So I'd have to really look at okay, is there a proverb that's represented in an Italian source, right, or um, at the same place so that you can actually say, yes, he must have seen this somehow and then taken over. But they are also, as common as proverbs are, they're often sometimes also um, 
They occur across languages, many of them, but some of them are also particular to languages, to individual languages. So you kind of have to see um, in the end, um, you know, how he, does he come up with a particularly English proverb for something or, or not? So thanks, thanks for that question. That's actually, that's a, that gives me a nice path to think about actually. Thank you so much. Joanna, did you have a question for Eileen before? Oh, I was, well, I was kind of curious about, well, so for one, um, you had mentioned in your first slide that the, that these entremets are often used to make um, political and or express political and religious concepts. And I was just curious about more examples of that, like what kind of concepts are being expressed and... Um, yeah, so the most famous example that I can think of is the Feast of the Pheasant in 1454 in which the cumulative uh, import of the entremet is we need to go on a crusade. Mm. Constantinople has just fallen. Um, they brought out a live pheasant and um, Philip, the, Philip the Good um, asked all of the attendees to pledge either money or people or both or individually pledge to go on crusade and they all swore on the pheasant, which is, of course, picking up on the romance tradition of the vow of the peacock. <laughs> um, so it's a lot of life imitating art, um, but that was really specific. So they had um, courtiers um, portraying various virtues. Um, one courtier was portraying the church who was literally besieged by people dressed up very offensively, I'm sure, as Saracens. Um, so it's really not subtle. <laughs> and they're called subtleties in English, but um, it's not a subtle genre of expression. That, that uh, first image that you showed mm. um, had in the, in the uh, margin uh, an, uh, an army besieging a castle. Yes. But it seemed to be part of the dinner ceremony. It wasn't separated by, a, by, by the kind of, uh, you know, architectural frame. It that... wouldn't necessarily be separated. Yeah, it would be. That's, a, that's an image of an entremet. Um, so that could have been like a, a play being performed? Mm -hmm. uh, there would often be plays performed in addition to... The, basically, space was not very well delineated in feasts that had these kinds of entertainment. And so there would be things on tables. Um, that people would be encouraged to go and look at um, and not necessarily physically interact with, although sometimes that would be the case. And you would also find um, that plays would cast members of the court in them. And so there, it's a very permeable space between um, like the professional performer and the courtly performer. Um, yeah. Eileen, in which type of historical texts do you find this evidence or information about entremets? Is... So um, yes. for the paper I was relying mainly on recipe collections which are describing how you would do something because I'm interested in processes and, and in technique and labor. Um, but you, they show up in chronicles um, very frequently. And so what's interesting there however is that the entremet will not be described in terms of how they were made but exclusively in the effect. So when you're reading it it's more of a literary account in which they're hiding the way that they're pulling this off and they're concealing all of the artifice that is really interesting because the point I think of the entertainment would have been like knowing, knowing that the, the woman playing the church is actually a man who you know <laughs> or something like that. But instead it will just say the holy church appeared. Um, so I think that that also complicates it when I say that the point is artifice. Um, so there are examples of like silver does that sing and the, the presentation of that initially is it is a silver doe. It's so lifelike. It's amazing. It's amazing to see. It's marvelous. Um, and then eventually there'll be an explanation like inside of this um, sculpture there was a, a soprano like a little boy um, or something. Things like that. So um, Chronicle accounts are really useful and they will never mention the food specifically. So if there were edible entremet, they will not talk about the food because that's de classe. And these entremets only happen in the big feasts and banquets or the, is it? Um, 
Entremet are a staple of any kind of wealthy meal. Um, you'll have the more spectacular banquets, uh, you'll have more accounts of those, but there are also plenty of evidence in account books. So we know that for certain weddings, um, 50 peacocks were like bought and paid for and presented in this manner. So there's, it, there is some discourse in recipe studies about recipes that were never meant to be made or joke recipes, but when we've got bills, I have a hard time believing that they didn't do this. Uh, do, you, do you know any instances where the process of cooking and serving itself became a show, an allegory with, you know, gods interacting, Zeus and his cupbearer or... Uh, I don't. Like it. Um, so, I mean, probably the, the chef and it just stays way in the background in the whole process. Well, nature and kind of messy and unpleasant. Yeah, it is messy and unpleasant and the, the chef would not necessarily be doing a lot of the cooking. So you would have dozens of people employed in a kitchen and there's a lot more emphasis actually on carving and you start to see carving manuals show up because carving would be done at the table. Mm -hmm. And it's a matter of prestige who gets which choice and in what order. Okay, I will send you, Stephen, the two questions that have been sent to me. And thank you so much for all participants for watching us, listening to us, and thank you so much for the panelists.